If you will, go ahead and be turning to the first letter of John, 1 John, <clears throat> chapter 2, is where we are uh, working our way through currently. And um, it, we've been in a section that has, has been interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, anytime you bring up something about antichrists or false teachers or heresies or uh, the, the, uh, those that are against Christ in some form or fashion, there's always a tendency for, mm, what's the word? angry people? I don't know. For um, pushback. Maybe that's a good word for it. Um, oh, my grandma was Methodist and she loved Jesus. Yeah. So last week, in this section, beginning back in verse 18 on Antichrists, <clears throat> there um, we, we finally got to those verses in verses 23 or 22 and 23 where he gives us the measuring rod, the, the way to determine whether or not a church or a person is a Christian or anti-Christ. So all of those that we've called out by name, individuals and churches, groups, ministries, uh, those kinds of things, other religions, are only anti-Christ, not because we're just mad at them when we don't like that group, but because they do not meet the standard that the Scriptures present. And what God's Word told us last week, what He, what he explains to us is that uh, the, the anti-Christ false teaching really comes down, the reason it's false teaching and the reason it's anti-Christ is it really comes down to just two things. Their belief about God, specifically the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, which would require you to believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Their belief about who God is and about the gospel of salvation and whether or not that's by grace through faith in Christ alone or by grace through faith plus some works for your salvation. And so we, we have the standard set. It's there. We don't have to guess. We don't have to give our opinions. Uh, it, it, it's not my opinion versus this other group's opinion to determine whether or not one is true and one is not. It's what does God say. If we are saying we believe God, then we better listen to Him about what is true and what is not. And that's all there is to it. So this week... We are, we are somewhat coming out of, um, of, of that section. We've still got a little bit left but, uh, on, on Antichrist. But, but to this morning in particular, we don't have anything directly relating to the Antichrist. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will, will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us eternal life. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have not left us here to grope around in the dark to try to figure out 
who you are and what you have done. Lord, you have given us your word and your spirit to illuminate your word so that we can understand, we can know the truth, we can believe the truth, we can be saved by the gospel, we can be sanctified by your truth, we can walk in faith, we can go through life in the light. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, this morning as we open your word, we need to hear from you. Lord, do with your word what you have sent it forth to do. Teach us, reprove us, correct us, train us in righteousness for your name's sake so that we might be your people equipped to do your good works. Glorify your name. Lift high your son in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. He says, beginning of verse 24, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. We've already heard this word, abide, remain. We're going to hear it some more in this letter. We've also already talked about the beginning, what you have heard from the beginning. He's, he's, he's already mentioned that a couple of times in this letter, and we're about close to maybe, no, we're not, uh, halfway through. Uh, we are... We have a lot more of 1 John to go, and we're going to see these themes repeated multiple times. Repetition is how we learn. This little book, or this little letter of the Scripture is one, two, three, four, five pages in my book. And he repeats himself multiple times in those five pages. We need to hear the truth. And, and not only in different sections. Sometimes he repeats himself in the same section, saying the same thing again and again and again. In fact, next week we're going to look at those next sections. He's going to talk about the anointing again and abiding again. We need to hear God's truth again and again and again. But let's just be reminded of what it is that we've, what he's talking about here. Let what you heard from the beginning. What beginning? Not the beginning of time necessarily, but, but he is speaking to them about what that church, what those people at that time heard at the beginning. Uh, the beginning of what? The beginning of, of the gospel to them. When, when, when John or, or one of the other apostles or, uh, who came to them and shared the gospel with them so that they might be saved, when they first were gathered together as the church there where they are, that beginning, when they heard the word of truth of who Jesus is and what He has done, when they heard the truth, that beginning, let what you heard from the beginning, the beginning of their hearing and learning, about the gospel of Christ, the truth of who He is, and the truth of His gospel. This is the word of Christ and the word about Christ. And for us now, it is what we have heard from the beginning, what we have now inscripturated in the Bible. It is for us. We let what we have heard, church, let what God has said to us about His truth, let His truth abide in you. This word abide, as we looked at before, when we, when we looked at it in, in the previous verses, it means remain. It's just a, a common term we, we all know. To abide in something is to remain in it. Uh, in particular, to, to abide in, in the faith or to remain in the faith is to persevere through uh, the faith, to, to stay in it, right? Um, but what he's talking about here is, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. He's not necessarily telling us uh, to abide, but to have something abide in us. He says, let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. So how do we let what we've heard abide in us. Well, first of all, what we have heard, what we have learned, uh, we need to be sure that what we are learning, what we have heard, 
uh, that we are only letting what God has actually said remain in us, abide in us. We, we need to be committed then uh, to sola scriptura, that, that scripture alone. We, we don't need to let what we've heard from the beginning just randomly out there. We don't need, we don't need man's opinions. We don't need uh, what so-and-so church of this has told us we need to believe. We need to let what we've heard from the beginning, we need to let what God's Word says abide in us. So we need to be making sure that what we are receiving, what we are believing, what we are hearing is only what God says to us. That way, as we let that abide in us, we're, we're abiding in the right thing. So, so we need to, first of all, make sure we're only getting what God has said. Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> well, hold on. As I've mentioned, these last few weeks have been interesting hearing from some of y'all. Um, and those are, those are good questions. I love questions from the church who, who are trying to understand some of the things that we're that I'm teaching, of course, um, questions about, hey, what about this group that you mentioned or that group that you mentioned? Serious, seriously interested in, in finding out the truth. Those are good questions, so that, that's not really what I'm talking about. But beyond that, there's also been some controversy. I probably shouldn't have, but I did uh, post it on social media, just a, a statement, a very simple statement, that Mormonism is not Christianity. It, it, some of y'all saw that on Facebook. Probably not as many of y'all saw that on Twitter. It went nuts over there. There was like 2,000 people that have commented on that or liked it or, and, and, and just threads and threads of comments. And it's, what's interesting to me is that some of the people that are saying, yeah, you're right, are Catholics and Church of Christ. <laughs> and I'm like, uh-oh, y'all are next, but I'm not going <laughs> to... I'm not going to do that probably this time. I'm going to just let it go and just <laughs> focus on the truth. But, but I just made that simple statement. Why? Well, as we've been talking about, it's a different gospel. It's a different Jesus. It's not Christianity. Not true Christianity. Not biblical Christianity. Uh, it might be called by the world Christian, but we know, again, the truth is, what does God's Word say? So we, that's what I'm saying. We, we need to make sure we're only letting what God says remain in us because there are other Gospels. There are other Jesuses. They're not real, but they're out there. And people are believing them. So we, gotta, we have to be careful. Galatians chapter 1 then, verses 6 through 9. Listen to this passage. I am astonished, Paul says. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. You see, Jesus, the true Jesus, and His gospel. That's, the, that's the, the measuring stick. He says, verse 7, Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Here's what he says, But even if we, this is Paul talking to the Galatians, even if we, that meaning, even if us apostles, he's saying, even if we, or even an angel from heaven should come and preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. Amen. Now, just specifically to what I just mentioned, in the Mormon faith, they believe an angel came down and gave them the Book of Mormon. How can you say you believe this Bible when it says don't believe an angel who brings a different gospel and then believe an angel that brings a different gospel? You can't. It's not the same thing. That's just one example. But verse 9 finishes, finishes it up. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And then 2 Corinthians 11.4, I won't read it, but he also, in that, in that section, he warns us about not just those who believe a different gospel, but also to believe a different Jesus and have a different spirit. We have to be sure, first and foremost, as we're looking at these, this word here, 
Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. We have to be sure that we're only letting the truth of the Scriptures abide in us. Don't just let what you've been told or what somebody, uh, somebody else preached to you or what your parents made you believe growing up abide in you. Make sure it's God's Word. Make sure it's truth. Make sure it's what you have heard from the beginning. And he's referring to the truth of what they've heard in the beginning, not just what you grew up believing necessarily. It has to be the truth of the Scriptures. But second... We actually have to let the word, the truth, abide, remain in us. How did we do that? Well, we've got to meditate on his word. We need to read it over and over again. We need to memorize the scriptures. We need to be listening to it. We need to be talking about it. We need to be hearing it preached and taught. We have to let it remain. We have to practice the doctrine of memorization. We need to be like our brother David Miller. We've got to work hard at it. He, as, he, as he proclaimed his, himself, he, he did, did not, it wasn't a gift. He didn't have the gift of memorizing. He worked hard at it. It takes work. You have to let the Word abide in you. That means you have to do the work to make sure it's abiding in you. And this wasn't, again, just David's idea or anybody else's idea who wants to just know the Bible a lot. This is what the people of God have always done. Psalm chapter 119, you know where I'm going. Psalm 119, verse 11, he says, I have hidden your word. This is the King David, who was a man after God's own heart. He says, I have hidden your word. It's a prayer to God. I've hidden your word. He's talking to God. Your word, Scripture, in my heart, I have hidden. I took the time to read and to study and to med meditate on and to memorize your word, to hide it in my heart. This isn't just an Old Testament idea, and there's other places we could go. I could spend a whole lot of time talking about the importance of God's Word uh, all the way from the Old Testament to, to now. But look at what, just one New Testament example. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. <laughs> it doesn't say... Uh, I don't know about y'all, but my idea of rich is not, well, I read my verse this morning in my daily bread. If you do that, great. Don't stop doing that. Richly means more than just that. It's oozing out of you. You're always hearing. You're always listening. You're always meditating on. You're, you're thinking of God's Word before you do anything. As you're doing everything, as you're responding and reacting to the world around you, as you're going through life, it dwells in you richly. That, that takes work. Let it do that. That doesn't mean let it do it like sit back and just... We don't learn by osmosis as funny as that poster is in science class growing up. We have to do something. We have to, we have to work at it. It is, it is difficult, hard work, but we must let God's Word dwell in us richly. See, we, we all have more access to the Scriptures than any, uh, any other time in church history. I mean, you, you don't have to go far. In fact, you don't have to even leave where you're standing. You just pull out your phone. It's right there. We have Bibles on our shelves. We've got software and Internet and all these kinds of... We have all this access to the Bible. And, and praise the Lord for it. I'm not... <laughs> Uh, I'm not knocking that, of, of course. We, we have all this kind of access that we need that, that many in church history didn't have. Even before, you know, they even had the printing press and all of that. It was just less accessible. But now it's everywhere. But 
it seems the more of the Bibles we have, the less of the Bible we have in us. We have more Bibles around us, but we have less Bible in the church than ever before. We take for granted that we have a Bible. Well, I've got it in my pocket. I just said it's easy to get to, so I can go read it whenever I need to, which usually never comes around. Or we have the wrong idea that we just go to it when we need it, and we don't realize that we need it all the time. We hide it in our heart, not because we need to have access to it when we need it. We need to have it all the time. <laughs> it needs to remain in us. Let what you've heard remain in you. We must remain. We must abide in what we have heard. Abide in what we have been given. The truth of God and what He has done. Let what you heard from the beginning Abide in you. The next part says, If what you've heard from the beginning abides in you. Here's another one of those if-then statements. We love those. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Ah, so he's tying it together with some of the other assurance passages we've already looked at in earlier in this letter. If what you've heard from the beginning, God, God uh, John here is writing. Who's writing this letter? He's he's connecting our relationship to God's gospel and to His word to our relationship with Him. He, 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 he is connecting those things to our salvation. If we have a, a relationship with God, if we say we are, uh, or whoever uh, you know, has the Son has the Father also, if we have that relationship with God, He's saying, you will abide in His Word. So in a, in a way, He's giving a test of assurance here too. You're, you say, if you've gone through all of that, and you're saying... Yeah, that's, that sounds like me. I believe, I believe, I believe. All right. Those believers are going to abide in His Word. They're not going to go away. They're not going to go astray. They're not going to find some other gospel or some other truth or some other teaching and be swayed by it. If we stay in the Word, if we remain in sound doctrine... If we do not get tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that blows by, if we abide in His Word, then we will remain in our relationship with God. That doesn't mean you will lose your relationship if you don't. What he's saying here is that is a mark of a true Christian. You're going to remain in His Word. You're not going to go astray from it. In other words, then, if we want to remain faithful in our relationship to God and not be pulled away by other things, we need to remain in His teaching. Again, we need God's Word. It's not a, a, a happy thing to have with us and say, well, I feel good because I have the Bible with me. No, 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 you need it. It's not just a reference book for the shelf. It's a guide for every step. It is the wisdom we need for every moment in life. It is God's plan for us. We need it. So going back to Psalm 119, for example. Verse 11, I gave you the first part of that verse. I have stored up your word in my heart. Importance of hiding it in our heart. What does the rest of the verse say? That I might not sin against you. David is not saying, I'm hiding his word in, your, in my heart, or your word in my heart, so that I have a, a big head and know a whole lot of things. I need your word in my heart, God, so that I won't sin against you. We abide in God's word so that we won't sin against him. You see, listen, how often 
uh, how, how, how often do you have the opportunity to sin? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. The answer is yes. How, how often? Yes. Every moment, is it not? Every moment we exist is, 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 a, is an opportunity for us to be trusting God or sinning against God. Anything not done in faith is sin. So if we're not living by faith, we're sinning. If we're not doing everything we do to the glory of God, as Colossians, or 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 10, 31 says, then we're sinning. Every moment! Every moment! How often do we need to have God's Word in our heart then? Every moment. I don't need it for later on when I just got to the point where I, I just can't do it myself anymore. You can't do it yourself right now. You need God's Word. We need God's Word. Every moment. If we don't have His Word in us, we are lost in those moments, in every moment moment. We don't know what to do. We don't know how God expects us to act, to believe. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Listen to these words. You probably know 5 and 6 by heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. How do we do that? And do not lean on your own understanding. Instead, verse 6, in all your ways, in some of your ways, and once a week of your way, that doesn't make sense. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. What we typically don't read is verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. How do we do that? By in all our ways, not trusting in our own understanding, but trusting in His. God's way is the best way. <laughs> An old Veggie Tales song <laughs> gets rattled up in there. But it is. That's the truth. And so we need to abide in His teaching. And then verse 25 says this. And this is the promise that He made to us. Eternal life. So for those who abide and then thereby prove that we are His people, His, His church, tr true believers, real Christians, here is the promise that He made to us. That's what He's saying. He's made to, and this is the promise He made to us, Christians, those who are truly followers of Jesus, that abide in His Word, that abide in the Son, abide in the Father, that remain in the faith. This is the promise for us. Eternal life. So, when you hear the word promise, I like this little word, um, because people use it a lot, and it's misunderstood and misused, or we, we have a an idea of what it means or or we see you know some sometimes like broken promises we hear promises we've maybe made promises but typically when we think of promises in our culture in our context among people among man we always have this like insurance policy <laughs> I know you've made the promise but just in case you don't keep it Here's a contract. Here's a this. Here's a that. Right? Promises, honestly, among man, don't really mean a whole lot. They, they should and they can. But what I'm getting at is they don't hold the test of time indefinitely without fail, do they? Of course not. A promise is only as good and guaranteed as the one making it. With man, our promises, even from the most trustworthy of us, cannot be guaranteed. We are unable to see or to know the future. We are unable to make a promise about something 
that we are not 100% sure about. I mean, we can do it, but it, it's not secure. Listen, we as humans are unable to know if we're going to fail or not. We are unable to know for certainty if someone who has made a promise will actually come through 100% of the time in 100% of the way they promised. Even the most faithful Christians are unable to com be completely trusted to make or keep a promise. Why is that? Because we're not God. Because we are finite. We are sinful. We are frail. We do not have perfect knowledge. We are still fighting against our own sinful flesh. We are not able to make things happen as we wish. And ultimately, we can't because we're not in charge. But this promise, <laughs> this is a different kind of promise. This promise that we're reading about here in verse 25 of 1 John chapter 2 was not made by a man. This promise that he made to us <laughs> did not originate with John, did not originate with mankind, and we are not the ones making sure that it takes place. The one that... The, the He here making this promise is Almighty God. And if the promise is only as good and guaranteed as the one making it, you don't want anybody else making this promise. The Almighty God is different from man. He is not a man that He should lie. He is perfect in His perfection. He is faithful. He is unchanging. He's sovereign over all things. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnisapient. I'm gonna, I'll just say what those are. All-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, and all-wise. Our God makes promises and He keeps them because He's able to keep them. When God makes a promise, He makes sure of it. There is not one thing that can keep Him from doing what He has promised. It is as good as done. It is guaranteed. When He promises blessing for, our, for, for faith, for obedience, for steadfastness, or anything else in the Scriptures, then those blessings are guaranteed. When also he promises for faithlessness, for disobedience, and for those who reject God, then those curses are also guaranteed. And when he promises an outcome, or when he promises anything at all, it is guaranteed. What are these promises? Is he, is he still making promises? Well, n no. And, and everybody kind of went, ooh. No, he's not making They're right here. This is his promises. This is the promise. Where do we find the promises he's made? In his word and in the word, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1. Listen to Hebrews 1 and 2 Peter 1 together. Listen to this. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken, past tense, spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Meaning, Christ and His gospel, those apostles that He sent out to share His word, was the final was, was the promises fulfilled? Was, was, the, was the, the closing of the, the revelation? There is no more promises to be made. There is not anything more to be said. The, the revelations have ceased. There is nothing more to be added to God's Word. It is, it is done. 
We have everything. We have all His promises right here. Listen to what those promises, how I know He's talking about these. Second Peter 1, 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. All of that, all of the promises of Jesus He gave to the apostles, we now have written in this book. These, this, is the promise that He made to us. This is where we find His promises. This is where we find everything that God wants us to know. We find God's promises in His Word alone. He doesn't make extra promises nowadays. There's none of this... um, What's the word I'm looking for? There's none of this kind of, I'm going to go to God and I'm going to... I'm going to tell him, listen, I'm going to do this if you do that. And then think that he's going to come through because you told him he was going to promise something. No, no, no. He's done making promises. They're right here. If he hasn't said it here, I can guarantee you, you don't get it. You don't get what you want because you think God has made you a promise in your mind. He doesn't. He has given us His very great promises. They're right here. Uh, They are guaranteed to us because of who God is. And there's nothing more to be added. And so then what is the promise then that John is referring to specifically here? Well, it's the promise that he's been making since the beginning. Not just the beginning of this church, John is writing to, but the beginning of time. The promise John is referring to here is the promise made to mankind and specifically to God's chosen people. It is the promise to the ones... God says in Ephesians chapter 1 that He has chosen and predestined from before anything else existed except for God. Listen to these precious promises. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to what? The purpose of His will to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. This promise is not a new promise. This isn't a new promise that John's saying that, he made, that God made to them. It is God's eternal promise. The gospel of Jesus has been the promise, the good news of Jesus coming to save His people from their sins. It is the promise that all of those who confess Jesus as Lord and believe the gospel will be saved. It is the promise from before time existed. From before anything existed. It has been the promise throughout the Old Testament. It is the promise throughout the New Testament. It is the promise that we still have available to us now all throughout church history and even to today. God is still saving. God, the, the gospel is still available. Salvation is still available through Jesus Christ and His gospel. It's the, the promise. Amen. And this promise has an eternal reward. God's eternal promise of salvation from eternity past is called here the promise of eternal life. See here, you are made in the image of God and you were made, I don't know if you know this, to be an eternal being. Every human being is an eternal being. Every single human being has an eternal future ahead of them. We don't have an eternity past. We weren't back there. We started at a time. But every one of us has an eternal future. We have no end. 
but although we all, everyone, every human has an eternal future existence, the destination is very different. For some, passing from this life into eternity will be entering into eternal death. You see, uh, ha eternal existence is different than saying eternal life. You will exist forever, but you will either exist in eternal death or eternal life. Death is not an end. It's a state of being. And so is life. It's a state of being. If, if eternal death is the destination, you will exist in body and soul in a place separated from the goodness of God, suffering under the wrath of God in the lake of fire, in pure darkness, unable to cease to exist, but having no life at all. Only death. However, this promise is of eternal life. We will be existing forever, just like everybody else, but our existence will be very different. Both body and soul, we will be in the presence of Almighty God. Forever and ever. But this promise of eternal life is, is actually not just a future promise. It, it is also a promise for right now. It is future but it's also right now. It is both. We, as God's chosen people, the church, live right now in a, in a, in a, in a, in a state of, of already and not yet. This promise is, is, is for both now and for then. Listen to John chapter 5. Listen to Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Keep going. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in His self. And He has given Him authority to execute, execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. This life is also an eternal one that is literally the life of the eternal one in us. We are made one with Christ. We have a union with Christ. We have eternal life in that we are one with Him. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 is my favorite spot. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Jesus literally is our life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Christian, right now you have eternal life. You're not waiting for eternal life. You have it right now. What we're waiting for is the fulfillment of it all. One day we will enter into a new eternal life at the resurrection when we will be raised from the dead or changed in an instant and be glorified to a new existence, that only life, only, uh, that, that, that will only be life, that will, that will be only righteous, that, that will experience only peace, only perfection from that moment on into eternity. That is quite a promise. So what do we do with this? Well, as the Scripture tells us here, we've got to abide in the Son and in His Word. We must abide in Him and in His Word if we are to know with assurance that we abide with the Father. And if we remain in the faith, if we abide in the Son and in the Father, 
If we continue to live by His promises found in His Word, we know that we have what God has promised to His people, eternal life. So what do we do? Now you've got to do the work. Meditate on the Scriptures. Memorize the Scriptures. Study the Scriptures. It's more important than any other study, any other knowledge, any other subject. We need Scripture first in order to make proper sense of everything else. Do the work. Remain. Abide in what you have heard. The other takeaway here is that the promise of eternal life is only for those who believe. This promise is only for those who abide in the Son and in the Father. And as we've seen, proof that we abide in the Son is seen in, in those who remain in His Word. For those who have passed the test that we looked at in chapter 1 and 2 and have assurance of their salvation, you and I, we have this promise of eternal life. But... If you are here this morning and you don't, you need to believe. You need to believe in the Son. You need to believe in this Jesus who is God and man. Fully God, fully man. One with the Father. He is the second person of the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who came down to earth to take on flesh, to become like man, to take our place on the cross, to take our sin and what it deserved to die and was buried and rose again three days later to show that He had <laughs> life in His name. So that all who confess Jesus as Lord and believe in their heart that God raised Him from the dead, they might be saved. If that's you today, if you have not believed, if, if, if what we have been saying is not true of you, that you do not abide in the Son, you do not uh, abide in His Word, you, you don't have that faith, you need to believe. That is for you. Believe in Jesus, the true Jesus, and His gospel by grace, through faith in Christ alone. Church, what a wonderful promise that God has given us. An eternal promise of eternal life in Him, in His Son, with Him, starting now, right now. <laughs> We're starting for some of us a long time ago, but right now in this life, forever <laughs> and ever and ever. Isn't that good? Doesn't that bring hope? Doesn't that, I don't know, light a fire in you? Make you want to dig into His Word? God, I pray it does.